Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld Anomaly Sea Ice Challenge with the transhumanist Paragons of Pandroth. And well, transhumanist they are no more, at least not exclusively. Last time we left off after selecting the Raider meme as the second core ideal of our ideology, and we also promptly did some raiding, not only to stop a sunblocker, but also to acquire a way to save Nightshade from the brink of death, as she was, and actually still is, suffering from organ decay. After another run-in with some flesh beasts later that episode, we then headed back home, and that's where we start things off today, with our young but increasingly competent Dr. Elpis, who is now going to install a bionic spine on his sister Ellie. Admittedly, there really is no need for it, other than the fact that this will get rid of a small mood penalty, as transhumanist pawns don't like having no artificial enhancements, but for Ellie, managing her mood is actually a bit more important, because her too smart trait makes it much more likely for her to suffer mental breaks. And so we gladly see that Elpis succeeds yet again, improving his medical skill to level 10, as well as improving the life of his sister. Up next on our list of things to do then, let us study that signal chip that we somewhat cheekily got out of a Diabolus mech last time. Doing so will allow us to continue researching mechanoid technologies, not only to be able to build bigger and better mechs, but also to manufacture specialized mechanical gear. So standard mech tech is the project we will now focus on, although with just a single simple research bench this could take a while. Last episode, Psychic Sooth then also comes to an end, so place your bets on who the first mental break will be. In the meantime, we already queue up the construction of a high-tech research bench. As you can see, we still need a bit more steel and components for it, but that will only be a matter of time. Nonetheless, I think we can already do something to speed up our research efforts. After all, being transhumanists, the Paragons of Pandroth have access to the role of research specialist. And we are now giving that role to resident entity researcher Nazim for a 70% boost to research and hacking speed. Unfortunately, this will not speed up the rate at which he can study entities, but he can also only do so every two days, so this keeps him productive in the meantime. He will also lose access to quite a few abilities, however, almost all of these he either wasn't capable of doing in the first place, or so bad at that it didn't make sense assigning him to the task, so we're really not sacrificing much here. Very importantly, by assigning him this role, his expectations will also remain at the same level as before, unlike the ones for our moral guide Volek. His research speed meanwhile at a lovely 300% with a skill level of only 16, so we will see that increase even further if he keeps at it. Apart from that, however, the day remains uneventful. In the late afternoon, Volek and Lauren construct a pair of comfortable blue fur armchairs, with Volek producing the better of the two results. And would you look at that, it's a mental break, and one that happens with pretty poor timing. Nightshade once again deciding to slay an entity, and this time the mental break happens just as she's standing right next to one, so our sight stealer is no more. Very importantly, as you can see, the mental break has not yet subsided, so before we lose anything else, let's capture Nightshade to imprison her. It definitely seems like she's getting these types of mental breaks a bit more frequently than others. Perhaps that is intended. Either way, it means that keeping her mood high becomes even more of a priority for us. And that is why we are now changing course regarding our construction efforts. The research bench will have to wait. Instead, we are setting up a small gene lab. One assembler, one processor, and of course the gene bank. That's all we need, and we can now begin assembling what might be a rather useful xenotype. Strong immunity, mild sunlight sensitivity, very happy, elongated fingers, and cold super tolerant. Some very good stuff in here, which also results in an almost doubled hunger rate, but with nutrient paste that should be easy to satisfy. We are now naming this new xenotype Minka, after the patron support of the same name, and if we expand upon it, we will keep that name, just so it remains in play for a bit. Nazim takes barely two hours to put everything together, once again this is a research-based task, and so on the next morning it's time to make Nightshade a little happier. And not only that, the strong immunity gene will also directly counteract her sickly trait, elongated fingers will make her an even more useful doctor, and cold tolerant is the perfect gene for the sea ice. I might actually try to find some negative genes to put in there, just to get that hunger rate back down a bit, but that's for down the line. 
For now, she will consume slightly more food than even our gourmand Ellie, that is, once she wakes up from her two-day coma. And yes, I did notice that we just used up some precious Glitter World medicine. Seems like Nightshade's medicine restriction was reset after imprisoning her. A small price to pay, I suppose, for a permanent plus 10 mood bonus and an increase to cold resistance by 20 degrees Celsius. Over the course of the afternoon and evening, then, we spend most of our time researching, scanning and grabbing more steel and components, until we are informed that Nightshade is still suffering, probably a little less now, as her right kidney has been completely destroyed by organ decay. Fear not, we have a plan to replace it, and it's not a pretty one, as well as her left lung, which is also looking dicey. On the following morning then, a small overhaul to our prison cells. We are now turning them all into one cell with three beds, or rather sleeping spots, and by popular demand we are also going to install a vent between stables and prison, just so our prisoners don't freeze that quickly. We also receive our first quest for today. It is another delivery of mysterious cargo. In the past, that brought us both a revenant spine as well as the weird duplicate corpse of Maniac. We'll see what it is this time, as we will definitely accept the quest, but not right away. Instead, we are informed that Ellie has found some steel while scanning. Unfortunately, though, it is about as far away from the base as it could possibly be, so we'll keep scanning and hope for something closer to pop up before our current vein is exhausted. In the evening, we then also finally have enough materials to finish constructing the high-tech research bench, and just as we are about to bring it inside, a lone ghoul attacks. It's actually been a while since the last entity attack, although this one is definitely on the underwhelming side, and so we have ample time to bring the new research bench inside. As the ghoul then arrives at the base and starts beating on our wind turbine, it's time to act, but as you can imagine, this is a rather swift affair. We collect another shard, which means we can now construct the fourth and final shard beacon for a total boost of 32% to ritual quality. Afterwards, we then accept the quest for Mysterious Cargo, and we're doing so for the Side Trainer and the Void Sculpture, as the latter will further improve our rituals, and Dark Vision is really not all that important for us. The cargo then arrives, and it is a golden cube. Impossible to scratch, it is light and warm to the touch, and Ellie feels inexplicably drawn to it. And yes, this is the cube that is featured in the Anomaly cover artwork, which is also part of the thumbnail for this series. Unsurprisingly, the cube is listed as another entity, although one that seems rather harmless for now, unlocking the Pleasure Pulse research, which we'll get to in due time. For now, we'll haul the cube into our containment facility, so that we may study it, while Nightshade arises from her gene therapy, and Lauren begins making flak vests as the first cotton harvest has arrived. Maniac's genes have also finished regrowing, so we can now turn someone else into a Viscalaire. We'll get to that. For now, Elpis installs the Void Sculpture, and our Ritual Circle further improves. Over the course of the next few hours, we then slowly start clearing out our greenhouse. Those shelves only take up space that we eventually want to occupy with hydroponics basins. Nazim, meanwhile, begins his study of the cube, classified as an advanced entity, and obviously not eligible to be strapped onto a containment platform. For now, he does not reveal anything of note. While we can spot a new condition on Ellie, cube interest for now at 10% and without any noticeable effects. So she performs her work just as usual, until she doesn't and picks up the cube to play with it. I suppose we'll have to monitor that situation. For now, Nazim's study unlocks skip abduction, so we can perform a ritual now to bring someone into the colony, albeit not on good terms. Up next, I think we'll unlock the ability to summon flesh beasts, both so that we can fill up our containment facilities and also as emergency backup in case of a big attack. They won't discriminate and simply attack anyone they see. Ghoul enhancements will also continue, and with that, I think it's time that we test out our new ritual. The participants will be those with some mood problems right now, to hopefully give them a slight mood boost from participating in the ritual, and with all of our recent improvements, ritual quality now sits at 
meaning whoever we skip in here will be in a coma for only three days. Like I said, it's not exactly a voluntary process. It's also a process that consumes 60 units of bioferrite, so we probably won't be able to use it all the time, but for our purposes today, once will be enough. And there we go, the skip abduction is complete, and our abducted target appears in the middle of the circle, a 29-year-old abrasive jealous pirate of an enemy faction without any skills that we desperately need. He is now in a psychic coma, so capturing him is no problem, and even though he is in a coma, we can keep doing stuff with him, just wait and see. Still, for the night at least everyone gets some rest, and on the next morning we unlock standard mech tech. Up next would be High and Ultra, but as you can see, those require even more advanced signal chips that we can only grab from even more advanced mechanoids, nothing we want to bother with at the moment. Instead, I think it's time to focus on getting some of the truly late game stuff in play. The problem is, making things like marine armor or bionic body parts all takes advanced components, so we should probably get those unlocked first with advanced fabrication. Unfortunately, to research that we need a multi-analyzer, and to build one we need plenty more components, so until we have those, let's research the neural supercharger. You may have noticed that our pawns are asking for this since we jumped into moderate expectations territory, and it is indeed a staple of the transhumanist belief, we'll talk more about it once the thing is actually unlocked. And just like that, we are back at the ritual spots, ready for our first chronophagy ritual, for a change, the Invoker will be Maniac, as this ritual is used to make the Invoker younger, at the cost of aging the target. That target is then of course none other than our abductee, and thanks to an impressive ritual quality, this will transfer a whole 20 years of age from him to Maniac. Once again, the procedure consumes some bioferrite, but only 20 units this time, and at the end of it, Maniac will be a young 61, still by far the oldest pawn in the colony, but no longer in his 80s. What's even better, this procedure also has the chance of healing some scars and other age-related ailments. In this case, Maniac is cured of two scars, which also removes some of his pain. Overall, I would call this a huge success. Our abductee, meanwhile, has received a psychic scar on his brain, and unfortunately for him, we are also far from done with him just yet. After a short siesta, if you will, Elpis pays him a visit in the evening to extract what we need to cure Nightshade. A lung has already been removed, only to be joined by a kidney a few moments later. This also improves Elpis's medical skill to level 11 and allows him to now immediately install these two organs in Nightshade, replacing her already rotted kidney as well as a lung that just gives up while the procedure is underway. In the middle of it all, we are then also visited by a combat supplier caravan, and with Elpis successfully finishing his task of restoring Nightshade to a fully functional human being, we send out Ellie in the early morning to greet the caravan. Unfortunately, they pick that exact moment to leave again because of the temperatures, but Ellie is quick on her feet and manages to catch up. We are now going to sell the joy wire. Yes, I simply feel that even for transhumanists, it's not really worth having one an old shotgun and a masterwork flak helmet that's just not cutting it out here on the sea ice, and in exchange we'll grab a low shield pack, potentially a lifesaver should we get attacked by something nasty. For the moment, however, we are the nasties that attack others, loading our drop pods once more with Maniac, Vulek, Ellie and our ghoul J. Alongside some chem fuel and components, the four of them are now going to launch themselves over to this lovely place right here, a mining outpost in the Arctic Mountains, a quest we received some time ago. We can grab roughly 2000 silver from them without having to fear any long-term consequences, although actually getting to the loot might be a tad bit more complicated. As you can see, our parts land on the wrong side of the mountain range, and the outpost is in that little outcropping over here, and there is actually no path to that yet. Luckily for us, we've brought Maniac along, and there is also a small bit of mountain here that looks to have nothing beyond it, and indeed that gets us quite a bit closer. A piece of wooden wall here then indicates that we might have discovered the enemy's back door, at the very least shooting at it makes them move. 
A short while later then, they break through right into our ambush, and considering that we are once again dealing with troubles here, this should be quick. Right, so things are definitely turning into a bit of a mess here. Our pawns seem to be completely safe for the moment, but they also can't seem to actually kill anyone, and Jay is also having a hard time taking his attacker down, so let's hope this does not turn sour after all. Alright then, with the third enemy down, the other two decide to flee, we earn our next development point from a successful raid, and we can give our pawns just a little bit more target practice. Afterwards then, we explore the enemy base, it turns out that most of it is underneath the mountain here, the silver meanwhile out in the open. And while Maniac grabs that, Volek already goes to town on the local ruins to acquire enough steel for the return trip, Ellie has also deconstructed some gibbet cages, and with that we do in fact have enough to get our first drop pod ready to go. Volek and Jay are then up first, taking a few of the spoils with them, although our enemies did not really carry too much of value. And with the two of them safely arrived back home, Ellie can now construct pod number two for her and Maniac to get into, and just like that, a short moment later, we are about 2,000 silver richer. Now that she's back home, Ellie also immediately returns to playing with the golden cube, and now we can also see that it does indeed have an effect on her. She is now completely fascinated by it, resulting in a reduced sleep fall rate, as well as reduced work speed. So staying awake for longer and working less, all to play with the cube, definitely something we should keep an eye on. In the meantime, we almost have enough materials now to build the multi-analyzer, even though, now that we started it, we will complete the neural supercharger research first. Volek can now also begin his death rest, he badly needs it, that is, after dropping his guns. This is, by the way, also the reason why we are not turning anyone into a Viscalaire with Maniac today. First, Ellie was out from being operated on, then Nightshade, and now Volek, and implanting that Xenogerm into someone would put them out of action too, and I just don't like having multiple people unconscious at this stage of the game. So instead, let's just keep having rituals, this time Elpis will absorb our abductee's psychic sensitivity, and he will actually do so all by himself, the ritual quality here already good enough to give Elpis an almost 60 day boost from a ritual that we can repeat every 5 days. By the way, this is important, it does not actually matter how psychically sensitive a target actually is, this ritual will always increase the invoker's sensitivity by 50%. The only thing we can affect is for how long, but as you can see, even Elpis all by himself is good enough for almost an entire year. Our abductee meanwhile continues to suffer for our gains, while Elpis now sports a psychic sensitivity of 230%, and that's without even having a single rank as a psychaster, our prisoner is now completely psychically deaf and has received a second brain scar. Elpis, meanwhile, is in a mood, so we'll have him draw some animals too, which reminds me to remind you that if you'd like to make a purchase of the Live Love Provoke the Void merch, or any other project from the Pete Complete store for that matter, T-Mill, the company through which I run my store, is doing a special offer this weekend. For every order placed, they are funding the recovery and recycling of one kilogram of ocean-bound plastic. That's a lovely gesture, I think, and your order will also arrive in plastic-free packaging, not just this weekend, but always, so I thought I'd share this, maybe it's of interest to some of you. The ritual then concludes, no manhunters this time, instead arctic foxes. Definitely a bit more tricky to hunt, as they tend to not retaliate when shot at, so it takes us almost an entire evening to hunt them all down, with midnight chasing the last one here to make it eight dead. A few moments later, we have one last event, a cargo drop containing blood, essentially, because this playthrough surely couldn't get any weirder. Some sanguophage out there is now missing 47 hemogen packs, while Vulek will find a lovely surprise when he wakes up again. 
Now, to wrap things up for today, I would like to ask you what to do with our abductee. He wasn't particularly useful to begin with, and now he's even less so, but in 18 hours he will wake up and we should know what to do with him by then. Simply kill him, banish him, make him a ghoul, or keep him for further experiments? Let me know what you have in mind for him. And with that, let's make the cut, and as always, we have some fan art, this week with submissions from Isaac Young and Crumpet Sounds. The latter actually happens to have a small YouTube channel themselves, filled with Dwarf Fortress videos, and some more drawings of the events that happen in those videos, so if you like their artwork, go check it out. Also, if you want to send me some artwork of yours, feel free to send me an email to pete at petecomplete.com. I might not always respond right away, but that is the best way to make sure I'll see it. And that's it for today. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.